If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Joshua 1, I challenge you to do that. It will also be on the screen. Um, and I want to talk to you about crossing over today. Time to cross over. Some of us have stood too long on the banks looking into the promised land and, and we don't take the step because we're afraid. Or we don't take the step because uh, we think that maybe someone else needs to go first or whatever reason that's negative and fearful in your life and you haven't made the step that you needed to make, I want you to cross over. I, I want to put something in your heart today. It's interesting how God leads us and, and, and takes us to different places. But in Joshua 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant's dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Now let's read those next ones. Verse 10. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Hallelujah, Hallelujah is right. Faith has its anchor in the realm of the unseen. It moves the invisible things toward the visible. Faith always actualizes what it realizes. Things that you can't see, when you use faith, you begin to see. It's simply not been manifested yet, but in your spirit and because of the Word of God, we know it's real. Mark eleven twenty two said, Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Well, the literal translation of Mark eleven twenty two is, have the faith of God. Have God-like faith. Have the same faith God had when He said, let there be. Now, if we have that kind of faith, that's creative faith. That's faith that changes the elements of of this culture, the elements of your life, the elements of your health, the elements of your finances, the elements of your family, the elements in your children's lives. It changes all that because it's the faith of God which created everything. And we have that kind of faith. It's available to every one of us. So if you've got the God kind of faith, you've got the substance that Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about, the substance of your faith, even though you don't yet physically hold what you desire to hold. This is the situation where um, children of Israel were, God's chosen people. For 40 years, what might have been a 15-day trip, they went in circles. They kept coming back by, I heard John Kilpatrick say the other day, they kept coming by, back by the same place. They thought they were going to the promised land, and they kept making circles. And I loved what he said. He said, he said, they started saying, hey, haven't we been here before? And then the next time they come around and say, wait, 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 this, this, this lake right here, I, I remember that beer can, and I remember that rock, and I remember that. We, we've been here before. You feel like that in your life sometimes? You feel like, man, I've experienced this same thing before. What's, I'm just going in circles. Sometimes that's because, you know, unbelief will do that to you. See, unbelief is a choice. Faith is a choice. Fear is not a choice. It comes upon you. But unbelief, based in doubt and fear, is a choice you make. I choose not to believe what God's Word said. I've been taught that that can't happen today. I've been taught that that's not any longer for now. See, this is where you decide if your faith and the dream that it has borne is worth it. Because it's a struggle sometimes to stay in faith. This is either where you break down or you break through. It's up to you. It's one thing to dream. It's another thing to take that, that dream and take possession of it and say, this vision, this faith that God's placed in my heart for this particular thing is real. I see it. I don't hold it, but it's real and it is mine. This is where children of Israel were. Forty years they've been looking toward the promised land, but they were going in circles. And I know there are some of you sitting here today who feel like you're just, with God, you're just going in circles. So now here they are ready to claim the promise. You know, Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people will perish. 
and the vision will die, and so will you. Before they could enter the land of Canaan, they had to have a vision of the result, and so do we. We will never get to the promised land unless we have a vision, a picture, a photograph of what we're believing for. Now, motivational speakers will tell you that. Um, these uh, multi-level companies will tell you how to do that. Put the picture on your refrigerator. You put it in your billfold. You know, they, they go through all the motivational speeches. We've been to those. You know, we, we were in Amway. And uh, how many were in Amway? <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Carol was in Mary Kay. We were in telephone cards. We were in something that was offshore. Finally, Carol and I have looked in each other's eyes one day and we said, we will never do this again. <laughs> and we said it as a comment to the Lord as well. Lord, we will not do this again. We will not expend our energy on that anymore. Now, that's up to you. So you may be a millionaire sitting here today and, uh, and, and have gotten it from those multi-level companies. And that's fine. In fact, if, if you did, I want to talk to you after church because we only owe about $40,000 on this building. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Before we can enter the promised land, we've got to have the God knowledge of what the result of the battle is going to be. No general and, and army goes in without a plan to defeat the enemy and to take hold and possession of the land. So here they are with one final obstacle. Moses had died. All the older folks who were in unbelief had died off. Now the young, the young generation of Israel stood ready with Joshua to take the land. But isn't it interesting how you get all built up in your faith and you go to a service and the power of God moves and here you are and you are just inundated with the presence of God and you believe you can walk out there and you can tackle anything and you walk out the door and the phone rings and it's the Jordan River. Man, I was so charged up. I could take the world. I could do anything. I could, uh, we're going to win this. And then boom. <sighs> every dreamer, every visionary, every believer who is challenged to do more than they can do on a personal level, every one of us will face the Jordan River. Jordan is a place God's ordained. See, we forget that sometimes. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm a faith guy, and I believe that we can win, and I believe that the Word of God is true. But the Jordan is a place of impossibility. It's a place of weakness. It's a place of helplessness and hopelessness sometimes. And all self-effort, when you stand at the Jordan, all self-effort has to die at that point. And as you go through this story with me, we'll find out. See, Jordan is the dividing line. For you, it may be a time of sickness or financial difficulty or family turmoil. I don't know what it is. But we have to make, as we stand there, we have to make a decision. Are we going to trust in the power of a living God? Or are we going to turn and run with our tail tucked between our legs because we realize that this thing we've been talking is not what we really believe? There's a difference in speaking it and believing it. Are we going to trust the arm of flesh and continue to try to do it that way? Or are we going to have the God kind of faith that is creative and will challenge the culture? It will challenge the, the laws of earth. It will say, I know this is impossible, but with God and by faith, all things are possible. So the cancer has to go. The marriage has to heal. The things that I've believed impossible because of my faith in the Word of God, I will do what God says do, and He will do what He says He will do. No one will let go of what they have until they have a vision of what they will have. I was uh, watching news with Carol the other night, and they were talking about there was a bunch of folks out. There's a circus going on in, in uh, not here, but not in this church. No circus in this church. But there is a circus going on in Springfield. And uh, 
And so they had those uh, protesters out there about the animals and the elephants and the, all that. Did you see that on TV? I thought it was interesting because one of the shots they had was the trapeze folks. And no net. And uh, this gal was swinging and the guy was swinging and they were doing this. And at the right moment, she let go. No net. I mean, I just watched it for just a few seconds, but it reminded me of this. And she grabbed him and he grabbed her and their hands locked. He grabbed up like that. Now, I don't know if you get this analogy, but you can't have the next level until you let go of where you are. That's true in every part of our lives. The better job, opportunity, without knowing for sure, let go. Trust God. The, the situation with your children, sometimes you have to just let go and let God do it. You know, there are many things in life we could use as an analogy for this idea. But we have to catch a vision of more before we will let go of here. We've got to see there before we go there, and we've got to walk away from here to get there. All right? So God brought Israel to the Jordan River at an odd time. But this is the way God does things. He doesn't just want to see a little bit of faith. He wants to see your level of faith exercised. It doesn't matter how much faith you've got. It's just whether it's exercised or not. You know, when you go to the gym and you lift weights, I say you because I'm not doing that, but uh, <laughs> you lift weights. You don't, you don't actually grow more body. You just strengthen what you already have. We need to look at faith like that. We grow the muscles that are already there, but they're dormant. It's already in us. Romans 12 says, uh, I, I, you, every man's got to measure faith. I've given every man a measure of faith. What do we do with that measure? What do we do to expand its possibilities and its strength and its ability to grab hold of things and hold on to them? It takes a strong faith. And the more you read the Word, the stronger your faith grows. So the Israelites had to make a choice because here they stood at the Jordan. It's interesting in the 15th verse of chapter 3, it said, it was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. Hmm. Usually 100 feet wide. I think that was, uh, you know, that's not very, that's not very big. You can kind of jump over that, swim it a little bit, wade through it. 50 times the normal size. A mile wide. Now we're talking a mile wide. Now we're not talking a small depth where it comes up to your knees. We're talking well over your head. We're talking rushing water, overcoming every obstacle. Things are flying through that river that were on the edge because it lifted everything and pushed it. Carol and I have experienced that, and some of you have. Tane Como, when they let that water out, I'm telling you, it changes. It's a nice docile little Tane Como until they open those gates, and all of a sudden, boom, and it takes everything with it. This is what they faced. They faced the floodgates open. Now, the Israelites were either going to cross the river or stay stuck where they were. And if you stay stuck where you are, you're short of God's blessing. You, you don't get to the place where God wants you to go until you've done some things that God's asked you to do. Uh, in verse 6, Joshua said, take up the Ark of the Covenant to the priests and pass on ahead of the people. So they took the ark and they went ahead of them. And the Lord said, today I'll begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I'm with you as I was with Moses. When you do what God tells you to do, he'll exalt you. He'll lift you up. I believe we heard that last week in the word that Brother Patrick had from the Lord. The Lord will exalt you. The Lord will lift you up. The Lord will put you where you need to be. Tell the priests who carry the ark of the covenant where you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. We honor God by doing exactly what He says to do. That's the way it is in our lives. We honor God when we do it by the book, by His book, by His Word. That's how we honor God. So Joshua in verse 5 said, Consecrate yourselves, for the, tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Verse 5 said, Go before the Lord 
Lay aside all that stuff. We talked earlier in the service about surrendering, about laying down our lives, about giving up all that stuff. Consecration comes from separating yourself from the world and crucifying the flesh and saying, God, I'm all yours. The problem is the older previous generation, they had their, their eyes were on the promised land, but their minds and their hearts were still in Egypt. That's where the unbelief came from. They couldn't get Egypt out of their mind. They couldn't get, you remember, 45 days into their trip after the Red Sea was closed and smothered and drowned all of uh, Pharaoh's army. 45 days later, they were sitting complaining and grumbling and arguing and whining about why they didn't have enough food and you brought me here to die. And they had no, they had no faith for the future. So this younger generation, younger generation, wherever you are in this building, how many are still young? See, I thought so. We got a young church. Joshua was saying, and the Lord told him, if you will consecrate yourselves, you will see the promised land. I say to every person who feels young inside, I say to every young person by age, it's no longer your problem when you consecrate yourself. The promised land is God's problem. Once you've consecrated yourself and surrendered yourself, then it's up to God. But if you don't continue your faith and obedience, there'll be a problem. So this wide expanse of water, this impossible way to get to the promised land, God never makes it easy. Isn't that interesting? There's always a battle, but, but the Bible says to us to, to have, be filled with cheer because the battle is the Lord's. So when we take our hands off of it and use our faith to believe what He said in His Word, the plan from God begins to come into action. So we got to stop playing games. we got to stop placing blame as to why this happened and how this happened. we got to stop retreating, stop backing down, step into God's will, use your faith to believe that what He said to all of us will come to pass when we trust Him. It's steps of faith that have to be taken to go across the river that's too wide and too deep and the mountain that's too tall. We can't do it on our own, and yet we try. Guy was walking on a mountain trail one day, slipped and fell and grabbed hold of a little limb. Hundreds of feet below him, he's almost dangling. He has nowhere to grab hold except this little limb, and he starts yelling, help, help, help. Can anybody hear me? Help, help, help. Nobody. Three, four, five minutes go on. He keeps yelling and screaming, help! I'm going to die here. A voice out of heaven says, I hear you. He says, is that you, God? Yes. Help me, God, help me. Will you do what I tell you? Anything. You ever said that? God, I'll do anything. And God says, let go of the limb. A pause, and then a voice that says, can anybody else hear me? (laughs) We'll take counsel from anybody in that situation. (laughs) When the Israelites showed their obedience, when they were willing to let go of the limb, and they acted upon their faith, God did what He said He would do. You know, you can write your own end to that story about the man hanging by that little limb. Write whatever you want to write on that according to your faith. When you're hanging on by a thread, when God's telling you and you read in the Word, God says, let go, and you go, I can't let go. I I think I'm talking today for somebody who wants everything God ordained for your life. I believe you're here today. Some, somebody. I don't know who you are. You're somebody who refuses to let go of that limb, though. And you won't give in. You won't give up to God. And not that you're so satisfied with where you are right now, but, but you are satisfied enough. You, you've made it long enough. And you're kind of satisfied with what you got. And you don't want to take a chance. And if you're satisfied and comfortable and okay, then this message is not for you today, okay? So just, you can leave now, or you can (laughs) put your earplugs in, or, you know, get your iPod, you know, all that. 
But if you're a dreamer, if you're a visionary, if you want more, if you want all that God has promised for you, if something inside you is in divinely dissatisfied, if, if you know God has destined you for more, then you're the one I'm talking to today. Somebody who is uncomfortable with the present, who's reaching for the future. Somebody who's willing to give up your dignity for his deity. Somebody who's willing to say, God, I don't care what anybody says, what they think of me. I'm going to do what you told me to do. Look, there's no victory without a fight. There's no testimony without a test. There's no, uh, there's no crown without a cross. There's no resurrection without a crucifixion. All that is true. So when we surrender, when we say, I lay my life on the line, there's a Jordan River for every one of us. You're not exempt. God is not going to just skip you across. You're going to have to do what you can do. Take your hands off of it and say, God, I've gone as far as I can. It's yours now. The Jordan River always stands between my promise and me. Always does. I know I'm blessed. And I'm highly favored. I'm favored of God. But the promises of God that are out there that I haven't achieved yet, that I haven't seen come to true in my life, the only way I get there is through faith and obedience to God. The only way I get there is to lay my life down. So the children of Israel were standing there, raging Jordan River at flood stage. And God gives a strange order to Joshua, and he says, tell them to start walking. Now, that's a test of priesthood right there, folks. Carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and the river is raging, and God says, start walking into the water. Now, you can either choose to do it or not to do it. Hey, George, would you come take my place here? Here, this Ark's not very heavy. Come on. Put it on your shoulder. It's okay. We have to start walking. We have to step into the raging water sometimes. We have to start moving in the direction of God's promise. We have, to, we have to do what doesn't feel comfortable. When God says move, we have to move. We have to go. You can't wait until you see a break in the waves. You can't wait until they shut the, the, the uh, doors on the dam and the water starts settling. You can't wait until it makes sense or until it feels good to your emotion. You can't wait till you see the waters open. God says walk into it. That's the tough part. Take the training wheels off, okay? Spit the pacifier out. Get rid of the crutches. Move from sight to faith. Start believing God. Move from I hope so to I know so. This is the time to get your feet wet. When God speaks, you have to move. When you get a word from God, you can sleep like a baby in a den of lions. You can walk out of a fiery furnace. You can do what the word says you can do only by faith in the word of God and stepping in when it seems impossible. You can do the impossible. It just takes a word from God. Hallelujah. Jesus gave Peter a word. He said, drop your nets on the other side. And you know our response. Well, Lord, I've already done all I know to do. We've fished all night. He had trouble believing. Toiled. We worked hard, Lord. I've been doing this forever. I haven't caught anything, Lord. But Peter had a change of heart after he complained just a little to the Lord. He said, but nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to do what you said. Now, The whole situation changes. When we say, Lord, don't you know what I've been through? And then we have a change of mind and heart. And we say, nevertheless, Lord, I'm going to listen to your word. I'm going to do what your word says. I'm going to step into the water. I'm going to throw my net on the other side of the boat. I'm going to believe that the lion's mouths are going to be closed. I'm going to use one of them for a pillow. I am going to walk out of that fiery furnace because you are there with me. One word from God changed is circumstances. He went from nothing to too much in one step because he believed the word of God. This is what I want to let you know. If you need a change, then you got to follow the word of God. No matter how scary that might be, Peter went from, and those other guys, went from a night filled with 
toil and worry and fruitless endeavor to a morning season of an overflow that he had to call other people in to help them because God's blessing was just way too much for him to handle on his own. How many want to be a blesser, not only be the blessed? How many want to be able to share what God has done with you and spread those blessings out to other people? This is God's plan. When we are willing to step out of the boat, we can walk on water. I guess the question really is, do you really believe God? Because if you don't believe God, you won't do what He's told you to do, because it's scary. When those priests stepped into the waters, as soon as they touched the waters, their feet touched the waters, the waters rolled back. As they walked, the waters fled. Not until. We sit in our chair waiting on God to roll the waters back. Then we struggle to get out of the chair and then get to the dry ground and walk across to the promised land. That's not the way that's going to work. Even David said in Psalm 114, verse 5, he said, why was it? See that you fled. Why, Jordan, did you turn back? Message Bible says, what's wrong with you? See that you ran away and you, River Jordan, that you turned and ran off. Look at your life. There's some things that have been chasing you, things that have been threatening to drown you and take you under. Some, it's debt, sickness, relationship, but there's a turnaround in the atmosphere when you believe God's Word. I'm going to tell you something. You need to quit. You need to do all you can do, but quit doing God's job. God's getting ready for somebody to flip the script in your life. He's going to turn it over. He's going to make the tough times easier. Whatever's been chasing you, whatever's been nipping at your heels, it's going to change. So you might as well get ready. Get your spirit ready. This thing that's been chasing you is going to be stopped by the Holy Spirit. When Carol was diagnosed with cancer, when, when we had that diagnosis in 2005, that was, that was not a good word. But I, I respect this woman of God. When she was on the phone with that doctor, I could see her, I don't know what you call it, tenacity. She's not stubborn. She's just determined. We tease about that. We're both a little stubborn here and there. Any other married couples kind of like that? Change the word to determined. I saw her determination. I saw her faith rise. She slammed her fist on the table and said, Devil, you will not take my life. In the name of Jesus, I'm healed by the power of God. Thirteen years later, She's still healed by the power of God. Listen. Now I got to tell you too, God sent us some people in our life that provided for us at least $100,000. Now they didn't give it to us this way, but God provided it from the hospitals and from the surgeon and from the radiologist. They, I'm not sure they knew why they did it. They just started giving us their services and the hospital started taking away the bills and we like, Glory to God. He sent a woman into our life said, I think I can help you. She had listened to my music through the years about sung with Imperials and the, and the, uh, the Gaithers. And, and she said, I think I can help you. You don't know me. She called us. She, she worked at the hospital. God put her in place. She called us and said, I think I can help you. Would you come and see me? We sat down at her desk and she said, I've got this, 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 this. And then I know this doctor and I know this uh, radiologist. And she made those calls. And Gloria was glorious for us. When you are in faith, God will provide for you in ways that you could not imagine. Amen. No, nobody walked up and gave us money. They just didn't require that we use what we had. God protected the resources that He had put into our lives. When you are willing to stand on the Word of God, God will do miracles for you. The Bible says that the priest that were carrying the ark kept moving until they walked into the middle of the raging river. So the step of faith, devil, you will not take my life. Then we stood on that. We didn't read the manual for the, from the oncologist. She tried for about 30 minutes, and she closed it and said, I'm going to read the word instead. I can't take this. It's all filled with fear and doubt and defeat and death. I'm going to believe God. And we stand on the word. Plastered our house with scriptures on healing and faith and believing and trusting God. Look, when you are at the end of the rope, tie a knot with the Word of God and hang on, 
He's there while the priest stood in the midst of the Jordan River with the ark of God raised in the air. Somewhere between two and three million people walked past them. Think about it. The priest lifted God up. We're going to lift up the ark. We're going to lift God up. And when we lift God up, things are going to change. Look, anybody can praise God once you're on the other side of the Jordan. I hear all those testimonies, glory to God. I don't hear a lot of testimonies about, hey, I'm in the middle of the Jordan and it looks like it's still dry land and I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm trusting God, but my legs are, my knees are knocking and I'm a little bit shaky. That's okay. That's not fear. That's reality. When you're believing God through the trouble in the middle of the Jordan, lift him up, praise him, sing to him. Sing to others. Thank you, Lord. You can say, I'm going through the worst trial of my life, but I'm going to praise him anyway because I know who he is and I know he is faithful. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises and all the prisoners heard them. The building shook. The doors, the prison doors flew open. People were saved. They ran toward God, not away from him. I love this part. All the Israelites passed through on dry ground. All the Israelites went through. Not one left behind. In fact, when they left Egypt, do you remember the statement? They left with silver and gold and not one sick or feeble among them. Glory to God. This is the kind of ending that I want to see in every one of our lives. The greatest part of the miracle is not just that they made it through, but there was no residual I believe when they walked past there, their feet weren't wet. They walked on dry ground. If the Jordan is trouble, which sometimes it is, the, the symbol of trouble, their feet weren't in the trouble. God moved the trouble. And do you know what he moved it? He moved it 40 miles back. In fact, there were some floods in the other part where he had pushed the waters back. Now, they not only stopped, but the waters receded to give them room. I don't know how wide the path was, but you think about I mean, we think of it sometimes like there's four or five people. No, two to three million. He made a path. He made a path that was impossible because God loves the dreamer. God loves those who follow him. God loves the people of faith. They move forward to the problem. I'm, I'm telling you today, God loves turning your trouble into victory. God loves the hard things. God loves turning dreams into reality. God loves turning crucifixion into resurrections. God loves taking that that seems like it's the end for you and making it a new beginning. This is the way God approaches all those things that are too tough for us. Hallelujah. I don't know if I've lifted your faith, but it should be. I'm just challenging you to keep dreaming big. Keep going to the Word of God. Keep grabbing hold of the the vision that God has for you. Keep Keep believing big. Keep obeying big. Come on, cross over the Jordan. Let's get past it. Let's not let it inundate us. Let's not let it drag us down. Let's not let it be the thing that when you you finally say, I give up, I can't do it anymore. Well, say that to the Lord. Say, Lord, I can't do it anymore, so I'm giving it to you. The only person who fails is the person who doesn't try anymore. The only person who fails is the person who quits, just absolutely quits. Never quit. Go to the Word. Have a resurrection in your life. Anybody here trusting God for something right now? Raise your hand. Something big, bigger than you can do. Bigger than you can do. Father, I pray you see our hands lifted. From the beginning of the service, Lord, we've talked about surrendering our life. And Lord, we present our bodies a living sacrifice to you today. And we say, yes, Lord, I've got to have your help. You've got to come on the scene for me. I can't do this on my own. Lord, I trust you with it today. Those of you who are watching on video, I want you to know that God is there for you. God wants you to know how much he loves you. You didn't make it here this morning, but he's there with you. His presence is just as powerful there with you as it is in this place. So, Father, we thank you for those who are watching by TV watching on video, internet, around the world. Father, I thank you. You're speaking to their hearts too. 
So, Lord, we receive. How many receive in this place? What I've said today and what the Word is. Thank you, Lord. We receive it. Nothing too big for you. Nothing impossible. We thank you, Lord, for being God in our lives. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.